Okay, the best place to start with a little bit of one to many of getting your expertise out there in a more scalable way is a client newsletter. Client, let's not call it a client newsletter, a newsletter, because it can go out to your clients, but also non-clients. The goal here is to take our first little baby steps to expand our reach of people who know from us and hear from us on a regular basis and are changed by our wisdom. That's what this newsletter is going to enable for us. The ultimate goal is when a client then comes on as a new client, they have a higher level of trust and belief in you, meaning they will pay more and they will get the hay out of your way when it comes to giving them technical advice. So we're going to start with client newsletter. Today, we're going to run through a whole bunch of ideas to try to make the creation of that newsletter on a recurring basis as easy and not sweaty as possible. I'll share with you my, my tippy top tips for how to make that really turnkey. So come on in, let's build a newsletter. I got 11 ideas for how to help you uh, put this thing on autopilot, make it really easy to put out a weekly or a monthly newsletter. First, people love to gatekeep this stuff. There will be people who will tell you you should never develop a newsletter because it can hurt your email deliverability. Ability. Like uh, all of your emails are going to start going to the trash. And if done wrong, yes, a newsletter can hurt your email deliverability. I don't want to go super deep into it in this pod. It's worth watching a YouTube video or two just about email deliverability, understanding like the different ways that you can connect with a newsletter system to like make it look like it's coming from your domain. Where this goes sideways and the wrong way to do this is when people buy lists of email addresses or you sponsor an event and you get, you know, 3000 email addresses as a result. And you put all these emails onto a list and then you start, you just, you go and blast them. A big percentage of those people are going to mark that as spam because they never opted in. That's not what we're doing here. Don't do that. What we're doing is we are just sending a newsletter to the folks who have opted in, who have subscribed to it, or they're already on your client list. So they already know who you are. That's who we're emailing. So in the context of the newsletter we're talking about here, you should not have people mass reporting you as spam. That shouldn't be an issue. Don't abuse this. Like if you want to go out and like buy email lists and stuff like that, that's a whole nother project. And that is worth being more mindful of deliverability. And that, that probably goes beyond, you know, what I can give you helpful information on. But for the bulk of small firms who are running a firm, you've got clients and you're looking to expand your reach a bit. Don't overthink this one because we're not like pumping in tons and tons of emails from folks who haven't opted in. Okay. So when it comes to making this as turnkey as possible, uh, I want to stick a word into your brain that makes all of content creation easier. And that word is formats. F-O-R-M-A-T-S, formats. Always be thinking about content through the lens of formats. When somebody follows you or subscribes to a newsletter, subscribes to your YouTube channel, they do it because they saw something that they liked and they want more of that thing. And if you've seen uh, the Eurovision Song Contest movie on Netflix, highly recommend Will Ferrell and Rachel McAdams, they are like these, I don't remember where they're from, some sort of Nordic country. Is it Finland? I don't know. And basically they, they are music artists and there's this song that everybody loves and the song is called Ya Ya Ding Dong. And anytime they go and play, uh, if they play something else, everybody just gets upset and they all shout, no, play more Ya Ya Ding Dong. And unfortunately on social media, a lot of growth and long-term success is playing Ya Ya Ding Dong. It's landing on a format that people like and giving them more of that format. Um, if you change it up on somebody every single time and you give them something wildly different, that may not be a thing that that person wants, right? Like the reason they opted in in the first place was that thing that gave them value. And that's kind of the format that they were expecting. And uh, so like the worst, the, the bad side of that is like, you feel like you're playing Yaya Ding Dong until the end of time. The upside of that is that format makes it much easier to produce that stuff consistently because you have a format. You don't have to rethink it all from scratch every single time. Some people write newsletters that are just like a single long form thing, or it doesn't even have to be very long, but like it's just their writing. It is their like brain being dumped onto a page. I'm not capable of that, or I'm either not capable of that, or I haven't spent the effort to get good at that. And I would argue that's probably where most accountants land too, is it's not easy for you to sit down at a blank page and just write. What I prefer to do instead of my newsletter is I've got like several chunks and those chunks generally don't change. 
And those are sections that are recurring formats within a newsletter. Sometimes I'll cycle one in, cycle one out. I'll try to generally track like which of those sections people are engaging with and getting value from. And if something's not hitting, I'll, I'll pull that out and pull something else in. And so these 11 ideas are potential formats. They can be, they could be the entire newsletter. Uh, it could be itty bitty parts of your newsletter, but land on a few formats that will feel easy for you to create on a recurring basis. And then putting together that newsletter every week, every month, whatever it is, that's going to be a lot easier. And for each of these formats, develop a place where you can put some of this stuff on the shelf. Like the worst place to be is when you uh, like sit down and you're like, okay, the newsletter has to go out in an hour. What am I going to write? Like you never want to end up there. You want to be able to collect things that can get plugged into these formats so that it's just a matter of like cobbling it together and sending it out. So 11 ideas here. These are format ideas. Okay, number one, bonus points if you put a fun little fun little name on the on the format. Stuff you should know. I guess there already is a podcast that's called that. That's okay. You don't need to, that doesn't need to get in the way. Stuff you should know. It is a section that is just like a non-obvious tip. Don't go too technical here. It's something that you wish all of your clients knew. So uh, if I'm a tax pro, I want all of my clients to know here is the right way to have a mileage log or here is the right way to claim the Augusta rule or whatever it is. We've got a million of these things in our heads because we're so opinionated on this stuff, right? If you're a bookkeeper, some of those things may be around systems, around how to manage receipts, um, um, around how to classify things, around how to read part of a balance sheet or, or a profit and loss. We got these things for days, and that is that is the hallmark of a good um, format, is something that you could sit down and do ad nauseum. If you're professionally been doing this for very long, you have so much information in your head from answering questions every single day, from actually doing the work. You have so much information in your head. There is more than enough there to build a newsletter, to write a book, whatever it is. It's just not in the right format yet. It's part of the value of formats is it creates some constraints through which you can give people value. Number two, Q&A. What questions did you get asked that week? Man, that's why I do a Q&A every single week on this podcast is a huge percentage of the questions people ask are the same. Uh, and there's a lot of repeat questions there and that's fine. But if somebody else has that question, uh, a bunch of people in your client base are gonna have that question as well. And Q&A stuff oftentimes is framed as like one-on-one, -on -one, a person providing value to another person. There's actually a ton of value in asking questions in public in transparent ways where everybody can see it. It's why I don't do one-on-one -on -one consulting engagements, but I'll basically consult people like in a context where other folks can see it because maybe other folks have that same question, but even if they don't, there's going to be a lot of folks that can benefit from uh, seeing the answer to that question. Maybe it's something that they hadn't considered. And if you're an accountant, you spend a huge percentage of your time just answering questions. And we might think that it's like, oh, this is too nuanced, or the answer is too specific to this person. It's not going to be helpful to other people. Usually there's a way to like, just like zoom out a bit and generalize that in a way that's going to be helpful for a bunch of folks. Now, other blockers here that we're going to be concerned about, oh, the client that just asked me that question, they're going to see that I put it in the newsletter that week and they're going to be bent out of shape. Honestly, that doesn't matter. Uh, in all likelihood, they won't see it. That's just like your spotlight effect that is only thinking about you and not anybody else. But also like they generally shouldn't care. Or you make them feel smart. You say, I got this great question from a client this week. And they, and they go from being like, well, why did I pay you to answer that for me? to, oh, wow, I, I asked smart questions. Now I'm more likely to ask more questions when they come up, which is great. Number three, oh, again, uh, Q and A's, another great thing to bank, put that stuff on the shelf. And this newsletter doesn't have to be massive. I make the mistake of my newsletter being way too big because I get excited about too many things. But that Q and A section could be single question, question of the week, big brain question of the week. Look how smart my clients are question of the week. And then anytime you get a good question, park it on the shelf and it's gonna make it super easy to put that newsletter together each week. Today's episode, it's sponsored in part by LifeLow. Okay, so thought experiment. Close your eyes with me. Lean back in that chair. Oh, yeah. Now imagine, imagine if you had a single spreadsheet with a whole bunch of your clients' balance sheets and P&Ls, all viewable in one place. They kept auto-updating from QuickBooks. So you could pull up a single spreadsheet and see all the clients that you want in a single place? Gang, this could be helpful for monitoring what shenanigans your clients getting up to for ensuring that they're keeping within like the profitability boundaries that maybe you had from a recent tax planning sesh 
How is it possible? Through the magic of LiveFlow. They got a new consolidations product that makes it super easy to roll up a whole bunch of different sets of books in one place. And this is obviously helpful for like when you've got a client with a bunch of companies and you need to report that all at once. But it can also be helpful just for informational reporting to see all that stuff in a single spot. Otherwise, you're doing the hokey pokey hopping around, jumping into all these different QuickBooks files. And the really nice thing about this to me is because it's in Google Sheets, you've got the entire ecosystem of other stuff that's built in Google Sheets that you can like put on top of this. So like monitoring specific cells, all that in a single view across a whole bunch of different clients. How cool is that? Pretty nice. The same tech, or I guess the, the same use case where folks are now using LiveFlow to like review month-end books for their clients, tying out balances, pulling in ledger detail directly from LiveFlow. That stuff keeps syncing and keeps updating without you having to like pull in the numbers, print a PDF to like put in a work paper, that sort of thing. Be pretty nice, right? All those books in one place, you're thinking about it. Learn more about that one. Check out the link below to LiveFlow in the show notes. This episode is brought to you in part by Tima. Helping you recruit top Filipino accountants without any ongoing monthly fees. The difference between TeamUp and all the other offshoring options is that TeamUp helps you hire staff directly. No middleman. You work directly with your new hire in the Philippines. Hire the person, not the company. Guys, gals, gang, here's just a few reasons to hire directly. You have access to higher level talent. Makes sense. You have complete control over team culture and training. They keep 100% of what you pay them and it's a lot more affordable for you so you can retain your team for the long term. Team up can source accountants with experience working at US or Australian firms familiar with tools like Xero, QBO, and Dex. Also recruit specialist roles, team leaders, tax specialists, administrative assistants. Thought experiment, what if you had an executive assistant for the first time this tax season? Hmm. Just, just throwing it out there, what would they do? Start at that email video I did on the main channel recently. Get help with that stanky old inbox. I digress. Team Up recruits these talented folks for a flat one-time fee of 4,000 US American dollars. That's it, 4K one time. Somebody at Robert Half just did a spit take. Robert Half reference. We ever gonna get Robert Half to sponsor this pod? Not anymore. And they can connect you with an affordable employer of record if you need help with payroll and compliance once you hire that person. Big fan of hiring in the Philippines. You know I did a bunch of that. Uh, check out the link in the description to learn more about Team Up. Number three, client spotlight. It's, this is especially good if you're in a little niche or specialization. You got smart people, smart people that you work with. And something we don't lean into enough is the value of being the hub of those people. Like there's so much value in you just being able to connect folks. So if you work with beekeepers, much like accounting firm owners, unless you've done the work of like building a network and going out and find other people to, who do this stuff, it can be really isolating. And conversations you have and, and hearing from people who understand what you do is really energizing. And so maybe there's a way to do that within your within your newsletter. Um, now that client spotlight, the lowest lift way to do it is to have a boilerplate form of questions and then they can complete it asynchronously. Doesn't mean that you have to get on a call and have a conversation with them, do anything live. Um, I used to do this in a newsletter way back in the day where I would just send them four questions and they would be questions that would try to dig into you know something unique about the way that that person thinks or a way to give folks a new perspective uh and this is also something that um you may feel like you're asking a favor of someone and maybe that could keep you from doing it uh but you'll find as you uh have like media properties like this and you ask people to do things there's an element of like being a kingmaker that actually helps you build relationships with people because they'll actually be flattered like, oh, I'm interviewed for this thing. Cool. That's definitely one thing with podcasts is as much as I'm, I'm kind of burnt out on interview podcasts because that seems to be just what everybody does. There's value in having that podcast and being the one to get to decide who goes on it because those folks are usually appreciative of you helping them with distribution. And over the course of having that conversation, you build a little relationship with them, or at least you have one more touch point with them that you otherwise would not have had. So there are, there are big lift versions of this where maybe it's a podcast and you're talking beekeeping each week. The weekly buzz, tell me about your beads. But there's also a very basic version of this that's just a form that you shoot over uh, with character limits. Oh boy, do people like uh, listening to themselves talk. Current company not excluded. Number four, highlight a great follow. A person on social media that you're getting value from that week. Again, this is another example of like the value of being a king, ma king, king maker. Uh, folks will appreciate you sharing what they do. And especially if you're running a firm that is at least somewhat specific, 
uh, that should be valuable to them. Number five, read of the week. Something uh, in someone else's content or someone else's new le- newsletter. What's something that you read that you particularly enjoyed? The beauty of this is it does not have to be a new thing. Like you can make, this can be something evergreen. Come across something great or a newsletter that's relevant to your clients that you really enjoy. Put that on the shelf. And the next time you're building a newsletter, you've got a little queue of things that you can include in that little chunk. Again, another example of why specificity in your client base is so great is if you can kind of become the hub for where a bunch of people are learning about this stuff, it's really valuable. Number six, app of the week. This could be an app from their space or it could be an app that's not in their space that just solves a specific problem for them. You've probably got a bunch of financial ones in mind like preferred app stack for for the accounting and receipt management and all that stuff. But this can go further more into like the ways that they work and the ways that they are productive. It's also something that could even be sponsored at some point. Uh, we did work with dentists and I did a little bit of partnership stuff with a, a group that was uh, pushing uh, dental clinics to go to fee for service only, so no insurance and monthly subscription. So uh, the folks that came to your clinic, they were all on a monthly subscription and that was it. They didn't have to have dental insurance or anything like that. And it was a group that would uh, provide the software to do this and also do like a complimentary analysis of where you should set your fees and, and help you through transitioning clients into this and all that. I did some partner content with them. And if you think of somebody like that, if you've got a newsletter that's going out to dental clinics, those people are going to love to get in front of in front of uh, the folks that read your newsletter. And not to like horn toot uh, or take our eyes off the prize here, you can make some meaningful money from that. And you are allowed to make meaningful money from that. Nobody's going to get bent out of shape if you have a sponsor of that newsletter. And if somebody does, goodness gracious, they shouldn't. I actually think like the most cool single person firm right now is almost like, or maybe like small firm under five people, is almost like the firm built around the influencer where it's like this creator business almost married to a accounting firm. So you've got a newsletter that's very niche and you know the folks in the space and the newsletter has sponsors. You've got a podcast, the podcast has sponsors. Um, and it goes without saying, creator businesses, I mean, can be massively, massively profitable. Even like little niche stuff like what I do, but you've got creator businesses now with you know hundreds and hundreds of people and they're leaning into content that's super high leverage. So the more reach they have, the more they can come in for you know, sponsor fees and partnerships and stuff like that. But some of that stuff can absolutely over, like, overlap with running an accounting firm and they make a ton of sense through the lens of finding a specific niche. And I, people underestimate how much, how much money and opportunity there is in small, valuable niches. Like my channels by traditional standards are just microscopic. You look at the general wisdom for folks building YouTube channels and they say like, you can usually make it into a job like when you're past a million and subscribers or something like that. And I don't, I mean, my channels are, I don't even know. I think my main channel is at like 12 or 13,000 subs. And that channel makes more money than many two to three million sub general channels. Not on AdSense, not on the ads that, that Google will play, but on sponsorships, on, on partnerships in the content itself, where you're like, you make it really clear, this is a sponsored thing, there's music playing, right? Or like the demo videos that we do, where it's like a five minute demo of a tool. Make it like plainly obvious that uh, the thing is sponsored. But when you're operating within a niche and you've got a valuable following and accounting firms do, these are business owners that make, they're like the ones making buying decisions. Those are really valuable uh, social media channels. So I'm, I'm kind of into the, uh, that idea of like a small firm that's almost kind of built around a creator business. What was that? We're on number six. That was app of the week. Number seven, a time of the year prompt. What should people be doing right now according to your suggested annual cadence? Uh, folks like being told what to do generally, um, especially during the, the slower seasons where it's maybe less obvious what they should be doing to like get ready for year end or something like that. Build this once and, and then kind of like keep refining it over time, this sort of annual calendar for how, what, what you advise clients they ought to be doing you know, each month of the year. And in your newsletter, remind them of that. What should I be doing right now? And that can just be like a one or two sentence thing, but at least you're, you're like keeping in front of them. And like, th- this is actually like a form of actively advising someone when that's in front of them each week. And it fills up a bit of space in the newsletter and it's something that you can make super turnkey. Number eight, a tax tip, right? Like, don't overthink this. You got a million of these things. Uh, What you're going to struggle with is you're going to go immediately to 200 IQ tax tips when what that person actually needs to hear is like, 
here's what meeting notes look like. Here's how to very quickly note down why this was a business meal. Like, keep it super basic, and people will appreciate that. Uh, number nine, workflow tip. And this is probably more for the bookkeeping practices. The system stuff that people get wrong. Like, again, we will overthink this big time. And, you know, the tips that you need are very different than the just elementary tips that your clients need. For both of these, the tax tips and the workflow tips, you can also mine this stuff out of other people's blog posts and listicles and all that stuff. The main thing you wanna do is just put it through the very specific lens of the type of client that you have. Like I can go down somebody else's list of 100 tax tips or 100 workflow tips and put those through the lens of beekeepers in a way that's going to feel very specific to them. Those lists oftentimes get your juices flowing too. They're really helpful for ideation where it's like, okay, I see what they're saying here, but that actually reminds me of this other situation that a client of mine had. And like in two sentences, I can give, uh, you know, everyone on this newsletter a tip that will ensure that they avoid this mistake. Those little bite-sized things, it's really easy for us to build up a library of those. And then honestly, at a certain point, those can even start to loop. Like you can even circle back to those old ones. It'll feel weird to you, but the reality is like folks won't remember it or you've got new people on the list that didn't consume it. This episode is sponsored in part by Cloud, Cloud Accountant Staffing. Y'all know I'm a big advocate of hiring offshore. One of the biggest changes I've made in my firm, we transitioned a legacy firm from 100% onshore local hiring to 100% distributed US and then 100% distributed globally hiring. And honestly, is the best thing I, we did. It virtually alleviated all of our hiring pains, completely changed how we thought about staffing projects and the type of work that we wanted to bring on. Because you know what? The folks we hired offshore, really freaking good. A lot of misconceptions around the type of people that you hire offshore uh, because your enterprises will oftentimes use offshore folks for like menial work. Absolutely not the case. Uh, there are tens of thousands of people working for big four accounting firms, you know, offshore uh, outside the US. You can get folks that can do anything from tax to junior level stuff to super senior level stuff. Uh, but try to do that yourself, figure it all out yourself. That's gonna be hard, it's gonna be scary. Really good place to start. Cloud accountant staffing, they will hold your hand through that process. Their story is super simple. Uh, an accounting firm in the US hired a bunch of people in the Philippines, fell in love with them, but didn't fall in love with the fees they were having to pay to the staffing companies that were managing these employees. So they built their own solution and now they're starting to pull other accountants in. I'd encourage you, a, a big tipping point for me was when I was like, I'm gonna stop being opinionated on this and just try to learn. And so I talked with other practitioners, I talked with some of the vendors that would like help you get into offshoring. Uh, that really opened things up for me. So if you've been on the fence, I'd encourage you to at least learn about it. And if you start heading down that path, consider cloud accountant staffing. One thing with newsletters is they are a little less evergreen than other forms of content. So like if you compare a newsletter to a podcast, podcasts probably more than any other type of media folks will go back and listen to the back catalog if they really like it. YouTube videos, uh, situationally, they may go back and see some other stuff based on what the algorithm recommends. Tweets, ain't nobody seeing your tweets after they're 48 hours old. And that's kind of the downside of some, some types of social media. Uh, newsletters generally are gonna be the same. You don't often have folks going back and combing through past newsletters. So if you're gonna start repeating some of those things, that's probably totally fine. You probably want more than like, five things that are on loop or 10 things that are on loop. But I mean, take this podcast, for example, I know a lot of folks have gone back and listened to all of them, but we're closing in on 200 episodes of this thing, gang, like firm handshakes all around. I'm surprised that I'm still here. I'm doubly surprised that you're still here. But if we did an episode at this point, that was something that we talked about in the past, it's probably fine. It's, gonna, it's actually going to bother me more than it bothers anybody else. Because is anybody really so focused on me as to remember 200 episodes later, whoa, you already talked about this, then you can't do that again. Reality is people aren't, nobody is as focused on you as you are, right? So like, it's okay to regurgitate some of the same stuff again. Number 10, Nerd Corner. Something for the folks who do want to go deep, which is not everybody. Something maybe a little more nuanced or fascinating to you. Uh, maybe it's about a court case or about this cool way to do this custom little integration. Uh, the more nuanced stuff, 
uh, depending on the, the types of folks you have in your following. Some people get really excited about that. And the number 11, key dates, upcoming dates. Uh, if you uh, did U.S. tax for the last couple decades, you know what those websites look like that have like the the calendar page, which is just like a population of every tax deadline in the entire United States of America, 3% of, 3 of which are relevant to your accountants. But you got this calendar thing as like part of a package of your website builder. Don't do that because that sucks. But for you, like build a year-round calendar of deadlines that are important to your client, um, like regulatory deadlines, but also deadlines for you and like in the cadence in which you work with your firm. Uh, put those things on a on a calendar and then, you know, every time the newsletter goes out, grab the ones that are going out for the next month. That's one thing I do on, on my newsletters. Every newsletter ends with from the community and I show live events that we're running in my accountant community over the next month. If you do webinars or you speak or anything like that, it's also a good way of like highlighting what you have going on. So it can be helpful, but it can also be a little bit self-promotional. That's definitely the case in my newsletter. That's how most people find out about my community is I just have a little like footer at the end of each newsletter saying events that are coming up and it just keeps people in the loop uh, because folks, uh, believe it or not, they will generally enjoy hearing from you. Um, if they've already opted in at that point, like they have co-signed on you and like your expertise or your vibe or whatever it is, don't keep that under a bushel basket, you know? You gotta let that light shine. It's a good example of, I think if you if you don't have your head in the game on content creation and you haven't put much thought into it, it is it's probably much more daunting on the outside than once you've kind of got your systems down and all that. And obviously like I'm a volume social media guy, so I've spent a lot of time working on it and thinking about that. And so I have to be mindful of like this the stuff that I, that is, not novel to me that, you know, folks may not be thinking about if they haven't done it much. But I think what, oftentimes when people think about a newsletter, they're like, oh, I have to sit down and have to have something novel to say every single week. Maybe that's easy for you. Like maybe you're a writer at heart and you can do that. That's not me. I don't think that's most accountants. So the much better version of that to me is like, I'm going to do like a format where I've got three or four chunks. Here's what those chunks are. None of them are particularly long. And then as me and the team are going throughout our week, uh, folks can put stuff on a shelf for those chunks or ideas or client conversations so that when it gets to the time of actually like dropping that into the email marketing tool, you've like already got that stuff sitting there and you're not racking your brain to come up with an idea because that's good stuff. Generally, like the good helpful stuff will not come from you having to have an idea or having to have something novel to say. And if you're like me, that stuff happens when you're taking a shower or when you're playing with the kids or when you're going for a walk, like, and so it's not as I'm sitting down in front of the computer. It's funny, like, that's oftentimes the least creative time I have or the time when it is the most hard to come up with that stuff is when I'm sitting at a computer staring at a screen. But have a good capture system. We've talked about this before. Uh, as you're out and about in the different areas of your life, always have a way to capture an idea or a concept at the drop of a hat. Even if I'm playing with my kids, I need to have a capture system because the value of capturing that in, in Notion or Apple Notes or whatever that is, the value is I can capture that thing and that is a potential like building block for something I do down the road that can make my life easier, but I can then get it out of my head and be more present. So like the, I, I'm more of like a work-life integration than work-life balance guy. I think work-life life balance says work is suffering and non-work is fun. And that's how you make up for the suffering. I much prefer like an integration where I enjoy the work that I do. And like my whole person turns up to work and the things I do outside of work impact my work. And like, that's just the reality of being a human. And so when I'm not sitting at a desk working, like I need to have a way to capture stuff because dropping that stuff into a note it gets it out of my head. It makes it easier for me to focus and like actually be present in what I'm doing. And so I took a walk this morning and actually had a whole bunch of ideas for like, oh, this would be a fun podcast episode or this or that and jotted down a whole ton of notes. And it just, my brain was just in a totally different state than it would have been when I was sitting in front of a computer. So make your life easier by having a good capture system, deciding on a few different chunks that you're going to use in each newsletter, building up a little library of ideas you can pull into that and then that weekly or monthly newsletter is going to be super easy to put together because people want to hear from you because you have wisdom to share and we got to do more than just share it one-on-one -on -one privately with our clients in confidence right give yourself some grace here it's gonna suck in the beginning it's not gonna be very good 
but your bar is also going to be higher than you know a lot of the folks who are on that list you're an accountant at the end of the day which is actually kind of nice because people give you grace and they don't expect you to be funny and engaging and all of that bonus points if in any of this you do like a 90 second loom video or, or something like that because it is really good for people to see your face but don't overthink it um it's going to be bad in the beginning there is the value of putting this out here to build relationships with people and attract new clients and all that but there's also the the even more important value of you learning something new you putting that rock hard plastic brain to work doing some sort of new thing that you've never done before because certain skill sets like getting somebody to do a newsletter, writing well on video, man, that stuff will always aid you no matter what you do. And too many weeks go by where all we do is solve other people's problems, where we trade time for money because you know somebody will pay you to do that thing for them. And another week goes by where the only experience you gained is solving everybody else's problems, right? That's the trap. It can be really easy to lose years of your life just doing that, just being the hero for everybody else. Meanwhile, the people that we look up to, the people that we want to emulate, you only know that they exist because they're visible, because they're doing stuff like writing cool newsletters. That famous person you look, look up to are like, man, I wish I could be their friend. The path of being their friend is doing something cool and something meaningful and them being a fan of you. But I'm, I'm just an accountant. I'm not going to do anything notable. You got a lot to offer, especially if you've done the technical stuff and you're the hero behind the scenes. I know self-promotion is hard, but put yourself out there. Because being helpful at scale, it's even more powerful than being helpful one-on-one. -on -one. And the marriage of both of those things is really good, I think, too. That's it for today. Thanks for coming and hanging. If you're thinking about starting a newsletter, I would love to hear about it in the comments. In fact, if you've got an idea for like a concept of what it could be, drop it down there. Maybe in the Q&A, we can do a brainstorming sesh to come up with a sick name for the newsletter itself or the sections in the newsletter or something like that. Podcast listeners can comment on the YouTube video. If you go to your podcast player, you'll see a link to the YouTube video. Pop into YouTube. I don't think you even have to be logged in. I think you can drop an anonymous comment. But tell me if you're thinking about doing the newsletter thing. And uh, best of luck. Break a leg. You'll do great. Don't ever think it. <laughs>